done on the bill from the original version and introduced it. I'll turn it over to Abby to tell us what's been going on. We had one walkthrough last week on it, on the original bill. Yeah. And um, I see in my folder there's an amendment here, but um, I guess this would be the amendment given to address. Yeah, and, and quite frankly, uh, I, let me just say at the offset, I. I, I did the best thinking or the ideas that I have at the moment, but I'd really rather have this just be a strike all with all the ideas that we agreed to in this committee uh, and that we're willing to advocate for. Uh, I, I have no feeling of, um, that, you know, that right. this would be an amendment. I would hope we'd come out with a clean strike all. That's fine. We'll get there one way or another. Okay, great. Great. So, Abby Shepard, Office of Legislative Council. Um, this is drafted currently as an individual amendment by Senator Clarkson. And it's 331. Um, so I can switch that over to a strike all and then repeat the language. Um, this bill, this portion really only deals with the tax sections. Um, so it does not have any changes right. to the initial. So in the piece we're going to hear from Maura, I hope we will add is the fourth piece to the bill. Correct. Because we have three so areas that we address student debt with this, with this amendment at the moment. And then I'm hoping that we will so add. Just, just to get a, a baseline and a framework here, I remember the first issue was offsetting uh, the uh, $15,000, $20,000 down payment assistance if somebody had a student debt, they can reduce their student debt by... by well, while they are, uh, while this money is liberated and this drives young uh, people with student debt into buying homes in opportunity zones. And that's the piece of it that Maura will speak to after Abby's finished with the 529 sync up, the employer tax credit benefit for the uh, employee, and the um, remote worker adding the uh, uh, payment eligibility of adding oh, student wrote, debt to the remote worker. Here as well. Oh, yeah. Because that's in another bill as well, but the, the major the ma merger of the two remote worker, relocated worker. Bills. I thought it was good to have it Both places. tucked into Let's several see. phases. Let's see. Okay, so let's hear about, I know there was a bit of confusion how employers can deduct and employees, whether they had to declare this as income. So give us your wisdom. Great, so this, um, this draft makes a few different changes as Senator Clarkson just went through. Um, to start, I'll just walk through each section and then we can address some of the questions that came out of my testimony from the first time we did the walkthrough. Um, the first change has to do with section four. Um, I don't know if you have the underlying bill there in front of you. It has, it's a deduction for student loan payments that are made by employers. So when an employer makes a, a payment on their employee's loan, that employee can deduct up to $5,000 under this proposal from their income taxes. Um, and the committee had pointed out the qualified student loan was restricted to um, loans incurred to attend and receive a degree. So this first amendment removes the requirement to actually receive the degree. So it's for any loan to attend higher education. So it's more expansive. So that's the first very small technical change, but there was discussion about that, that it seemed to be too restrictive for payments. So this could be people who transferred and didn't finish their degree in one place, but have student debt as they transferred to another university. Um, and this is for people who may have gra not graduated, but incurred debt and have gone to work for somebody. And are, you know, there are all sorts of scenarios where you could not have completed a degree and have student debt. So are you going to are you going to get into the deductibility factor and how that changes existing law? Um, well, so the proposal in S331 is to allow these payments to be deductible. So that's in the existing bill as proposed. And is that um, only on a state level? Yes, this is only for Vermont income tax liability, and this deduction is just for the individual. So this, the amendment deals with the deduction for the, the individual, just making that small change, but it's also, as the Senator pointed out, does now provide a credit for the employer. So it's helping the individual and the employer, but it's in two different sections. So right now, if an employer chose, under existing law, chose to give $5,000 to reduce the debt, 
it wouldn't be, it would be considered income to the exactly. employee. That's correct. There would be no deduction. That's and the correct. employer wouldn't get a deduction either? The employer wouldn't get any tax benefit. So it's That's almost correct. like a gift. Yeah. It, okay. Except it isn't because that might be excluded. So. Right. Okay. <laughs> this gives better, this gives more favorable tax treatment both, both to the individual and the employer. Okay. So it deals with both sides of the interaction. Do you know if any other states have done that? What? Maine. Let me look at Maine's. They have. They're fairly generous. I did look at a few Let me states. Maine. I, I mean, we're not going to do that. Just requiring the concept of making it yes. a deductible expense for the employer and employee. Yes. yes. Other credit. states have done that. Yes. Okay. That's correct. Do you? Uh, Where the we put a limit on it. Maine didn't put a limit on it, as I recall. Do we have any Connecticut in particular, and they do have. We have the, 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 we, have, do we have any projection of how much mm -hmm. loss revenue? No, we need a fiscal note on it once we've got all our. Once we're in a not. Are you coming back? <laughs> <laughs> I can let JF know. JFO know. That well, I would go there, yeah, let's make sure the committee wants to do this. The $200,000 and $250,000 numbers here will be very popular among Vermonters when they read that. I, I, is, is there a number in here? I didn't even see that. Okay, okay. so the 200000 250000 are the income limit, so they're eligible oh, okay. up to that. As I said, that's going to be very popular. We might as well do it for everybody. You're giving a benefit yes. to the 1% is, 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 is the narrative, and that is not a... It's not something that I think. But this is the first time we're seeing this, so let's. Don't take our heels and yeah. are these people going to buy in opportunities? Right. <coughs> well, no, this no, part. This is the original bill. Okay, this part, this part in the original bill is not restricted to any buy in opportunity zones. No, that's mm -hmm. a separate. Okay. That's no, more as part of okay. This is This is for deduction. Okay. okay. Uh, I believe Senator Brock is looking at page seven of the original. Oh, the original. Yeah, the original. Yes. Okay. That was not changed. So those are setting the income threshold. So an individual who earns up to 200000 of AGI or 250 after filing a joint return is eligible to take this deduction. Yes, because we were thinking of this more as a household mm -hmm. rather than individuals. So oh, just you, you look at you know the average household income in Vermont. You set that you're going to give somebody a benefit who earns up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars as an infant is going to be very very popular as you could imagine. Okay. The public being, perception of that in terms of the press, I think, will be. I think he's being facetious. Mm -hmm. I am. <laughs> no, I, I I hear you. I mean, the well, 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 wait, so I mean, wait, 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 let's keep let's. We're, we're nowhere near deciding this stuff. <laughs> right. But I do want to put it in perspective. And that is that how much is this tax credit worth to somebody who's making $60,000 a year? I mean, somebody could run those numbers. Yes. I mean, the, ta the marginal tax rate is in that area is probably what, 2%? So 2% of Five thousand dollars is a hundred dollars. That's what we're giving. I don't want to get to the same situation we were with remote workers when we had a bill that put in that was going to give them a tax credit of two hundred dollars for people to move here. So you know, I'm concerned that this may be de minimis in terms of what we're trying to do here. Okay, we don't want it to be de minimis. It would be de minimis in its effect and devastating in terms of its public relations impact. So we're the best of all possible worlds. We hit the jackpot. <laughs> So let's go continue through. We, sorry, we keep, you know. So that's the only change. The very first instance of amendment is the only change to this deduction for the individual. There's nothing else that addresses that in the amendment. Okay. Um, the next instance of amendment, the second, so I'm on page one of the right. amendment right. language. Yep. This now creates the employer credit. So it's giving a tax benefit on the employer who's making the contribution to pay off their employee student loans. I took the same definitions um, that are in the deduction language and used them for the employer credit. So an institution of higher education is only post-secondary, um, generally limited to graduates of secondary schools. Um, it could include public, private, nonprofit, and for-profit in for institutions of higher education. Um, qualified education loan is any loan incurred to attend an institution of higher education. Um, I added in some language here about a qualified employee that um, might, depending on the policy choices, might need to be changed. 
um, qualified employee as an individual who was employed at least, um, and I could have put part-time here, I took a definition from um, the labor title, 1,040 hours per taxable year, that's considered part-time. Um, I don't know if the committee wants it to be only full-time workers. I believe Maine does require that. So there's some uh, decisions there that can be made. And uh, I also did domiciled in the state for any part of the taxable year. You could also make that the entire taxable year. I think the entire, in the whole chat about that. What line is that? I'm sorry, so it starts on line 19 and then it's line 20 and 21 on the first page of those. Talking about the qualified yep. employee. So currently the qualified employee in this language is anyone who works at least part time um, and who is domiciled at any time during the taxable year. There's no minimum requirement for And I hope our intent is that this is actually a resident of the state and is uh, here for the, you know, who is, uh, I mean, I think those are discussion points, but I, I can't imagine us doing it without a resident, without working for a full year. I mean, for full time. Well, does this mean, is it the, is it just so I understand the intent of this, the intent is a person has to work part of the year, the full year, uh, in order to qualify for this in the first place. So it's an after the fact payment, after they've met that threshold. So uh, a person that you're attracting to the state, for example, with this type of incentive, isn't gonna get the incentive until a year later. No, I would hope that actually this incentive would be a benefit that they would receive on a monthly basis. Um, and we'd have to be for a full-time employee. I mean, I, I don't see this being or for part-time. That's not the way that I read this. No, no, I, I have, we haven't discussed this yet. I oh, mean, I actually, right. we hadn't oh. focused on that piece. All right. So I'm um, actually, uh, you know, I think of this as a benefit, like a benefit you get uh, uh, regularly on a monthly basis, and it, uh, would, it would be a benefit uh, that would be paid directly to an institution or to a, a, um, a business that uh, has, has been created uh, out in the marketplace that, that actually pays down student debt directly to institutions for employers. So, so the whole issue of that. how you define a qualified employee would yep, have to change. Yes, that's our but, conversation. Okay. This is a conversation starter, not the end. Although, I, we, Abby and I actually didn't talk about that. And just so I can just preview things where we're going, by the way, is we want to get to the housing bill fairly soon. I did this, put this in because Maura, who's going to talk about the other pieces, going away, and I want to hear from her before she went on. Okay, so maybe we should speed up on this. Right. Um, because there is definitions for qualified employer, qualified payment, having to do with whether it's made directly through an, uh, to the lender or a customized repayment program. Um, so I don't know if you want me to go through the basics of the credit is that it's being made to the employer, um, provided that the amount of the credit is not exceeding $5,000. Connecticut's credit is about half of this maximum, but theirs is also 50% of the payments made. So this is dollar for dollar every payment dollar made. And I don't forget that's- What is that? You said 50%? It's 50% of, of the payments made up to 2,600. And we're 100% up to 5,000. Correct. Okay. Let's see. Um, Okay, there's some administrative language in um, section seven. Um, this is a different uh, benefit altogether. This has to do with the 529 plan, so I don't know if you're ready for me to move on yeah, to that. Yeah, this is um, so a section. different piece, and that's what I section seven. got into. Section seven, starting on line 17 of page two. Um, that's what I got into in my last testimony. This um, would link Vermont. Vermont is decoupled last year from the 529 allowable distributions when you're taking money out of your 529. Vermont decoupled from that and only allows uh, distributions from your Vermont 529 for cost of attendance. This now follows um, the federal changes, so it's cost of attendance, registered apprenticeship programs, um, and it also allows upon death or disability of the beneficiary, you can also take funds out, so it's more of an equity. So uh, this is where I got really confused last time. So the federal law changed, right? Right. And allowed for more uses. Correct. Right. Right. Without the, because there's tax um, right. benefit at the federal level. So regardless of this bill and everything else, it seems like this would be a positive thing to do just oh. in and of itself. I mean, isn't this what VSAC is sort of suggesting too, that they... We haven't, uh, we, we didn't hear from Marilyn, who, who it, it, because remember, we couldn't, right. we ran out of time, but it would be great to hear from them. Okay. 
Well, we would have to definitely hear from the tax department also on the Yes, we need uh, a fiscal note. Once we're agreed to what we're asking them to do a fiscal note on, that's why I didn't ask for one already. But this stands this stands on its own. This is separate from I the mean, this could loan pass. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, and then the final change in section eight is to the remote worker grant program. It adds a new subdivision that allows uh, payments made on student loans um, as a qualifying expense to request the remote worker grant. Is this the same language that we had in the other bill? Just do the same thing. We have a bill. I thought. I thought yeah, it was bill two fifty six. I think that merges the two programs and allows for. Uh, Oh no, it's not the same because we had the five. We had somebody who graduated from the Vermont school in there, so this is different. Right. So yeah, we should sync it up with what we have already passed out of the committee. We haven't passed it out of the committee yet. It's in the other right, but it's in the other bill. It's in the other bill. Right. And then I made the effective date uh, perspective, so it would start in January first of twenty twenty one. So it would be for uh, income taxes filed in twenty twenty two. Okay, good. So, anybody have any questions for Abby? It's a, it's a good start. I think these give you sort of a, at least points. flesh out some of the, the thinking, the best thinking that we've had to date. And we've got lots of research in, and, uh, uh, on, the, on the other states, and uh, which David has sent us, which the UVM students have done for us, and they are uh, eager to come and present it to us. So, we. Thanks. There's lots to support doing something about student debt. So let's uh, hear from Moore. I mean, this, I think what Moore is going to talk about is the bigger piece of this bill. It's a, it's um, one of the four options. Well, but, 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 but in, in, right in the scheme of things, this is going to make a dent in student debt. The other one is going to be a good policy choice, but doesn't really save that much money on student debt. Um, well, I think an employer benefit would be very helpful for people. On a monthly, on, you know, just noodling away at student well, debt. With actually, yeah, on the employer I, I'm, I'm side. I'm sorry. Yes. I think that that, that would be on the employer side. Yes, the it's it's not just the de de deductibility. It's of, not just the deductibility. It it's takes, the actual cash right takes reduced reduced reduction of, of your debt right. every you're, month. You're right. You're right. Okay. Hello. Hi, Mark Collins. I'm the director of Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Uh, thank you for squeezing me in before I head out of town later. Um, I, again, want to start the way I started last time, just with two sentences to say I really appreciate that you saw the success of our down payment assistance program, which I call our DPA program, and um, want to expand it, Senator Clarkson's idea of expanding it as a way of addressing these student loan debt needs. Um, I can see how that makes sense. And since this was um, an idea that was brought to VHFA and didn't stem from VHFA, I'm back to just tell you some stats about student loan debt and our borrowers now that I've had a moment to um, look that up. And um, it can start to, so that you all could start to scale and size this what I think would be the first section of this bill. Um, I will tell you, I looked at, oh, I won't be very clear, my team at VHFA, I didn't do it, uh, looked at the last four years of our lending um, to our borrowers, and 45% of our borrowers had student loan debt. I would have thought, actually, that percentage would have been higher, um, knowing that our borrowers skew very young, but on the other hand, I think that that may be a testament to the types of borrowers that we work with. Um, we work with lower and moderate income folks who are first time home buyers, and um, I think that if you saw the educational outcomes of our borrowers, they may not match up with the state's overall educational um, outcomes. But the average outstanding loan balance was just over 37,000. And they're paying, on average, about $330 a month for their student loan debt. So that, yeah. And they have about 10 years left on their loans. So the way, um, this, is, this is This is for all your loans, not just the down payment assistance Correct. program. Correct. This, yep. the this is all the loans. I'm going to dive down into the OZs, the opportunity zones. Okay. Um, and just to put this in perspective, which is interesting, your debt average student that is higher than the Vermont average. The Vermont average is just over 31,000. Okay. 
So <laughs> here's the where they have that, and they have yeah. a lot of it. That's interesting. Um, so I wanted to speak to some of this because I know Senator Clarkson's idea was this idea of twenty thousand dollars and forgiving it over five years. So I was trying to just um, check your numbers to see if I would agree, but if, if, the, if there's 10 years left on a loan, then doing something forgivable over five years would be meaningful, um, as well as knowing that they have an outstanding balance on average well above the $20,000 you're talking about in this program. 20% um, of our mortgages over the last four years were in opportunity zones. That 20%? didn't 20%? Of all your loans? Of all our single family mortgages. And that doesn't surprise me because I know that our market share in underserved areas is higher uh, than what it is overall. We actually have a lower market share in Chittenden County and really high market share in the three Northeast Kingdom counties as well as Rutland um, and Orange County. But the characteristics of the borrowers in opportunity zones for us matched our typical borrowers. So what I told you last time about an average income of 63 grand and borrowing, they borrowed just about $146,000 to buy a home. It was $155,000 worth. Um, Sorry, they borrow about 140. They, in OZs, uh, yeah. they borrowed $146,000 and they bought a home priced around $155,000. Wow. So, um, and 68% of these borrowers in OZs got our existing down payment assistance program. 60%? 68. 68. So, um, <coughs> so I heard you, Senator, saying about the strike all approach and, um, you know, they had sent you sort of an edited version, but the yeah, language. We need to get to Abby, right. Okay. The language, um, last time I testified that got a little cut short, um, I was suggesting that um, the program be a VHFA program. Right now it's written to be um, ACCD in partnership with VHFA. And um, because this would be an expansion of our existing down payment assistance program in these limited geographic areas, both for marketing and other reasons, um, we'd like it just we, to be VHFA. We would like it to just be us because there, I can see the potential for there being a rub between two different entities discussing how are we going to administer a program and if we're ultimately responsible for it and designing it. Um, Can I uh, back up a little yeah. bit more to understand the money flow here? So in essence, somebody who has a student loan can have, they're not going to have anything of that student loan forgive, forgiven. They're going to have the $20,000 in the down payment assistance forgiven. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I, okay. So that the whole point of that is that it liberates that money, and they would have to show that they were also reducing right. direct directly reducing their student loan debt as a piece of this. They'd have to show that they were doing that because this is designed to liberate money, and we felt. Okay. And Nora will tell you why we couldn't mingle the two. Okay. But um, it's designed to liberate money to okay. reduce okay, so student loan debt significantly. Every so year. I think you answered this before, but. $5,000 existing down payment assistance um, is usually um, not even enough to do the closing costs, right? But the 20000 might be able to do the closing costs and more, and that just would it'd be labeled down payment assistance, but it actually would go towards reducing the amount of the underlying loan, right? Yes. Okay. Um, Which is part of the objective so that all their costs are reduced. So money is liberated to pay down student debt and they will have less debt burden going forward altogether. So you're basically a conduit to reduce people's student debt. <laughs> yes, uh, and the reason you, you, one- You're a conduit in a lot of things. You know? One could, um, <laughs> very conducive. Uh, one could make an argument that um, it would be more efficient to take $20,000 and pay down student loan debt. Uh, one reason I believe the senator approached VHFA for this conversation was that if you do that, how do you then get the person to 
root here, stay here, especially in these areas of more economic distress that we see with OZ. And so um, by tying it with a mortgage, I see that benefit, you know, and you can right. build in this 20% forgiveness over five years. Not only are they here, but they're going to stay. Um, and so those are all the reasons why this makes good sense. It also promotes home ownership, which is a big problem. Correct. Absolutely. And we know the tie that high student loan debt um, is impacting the ability right. to. How does the, the original program deal with the down payment assistance? Does it ever get paid back? Yes, when the first mortgage goes away. It's a second mortgage, and it runs for the length of the first mortgage. So if you are the rare bird who keeps a mortgage for 30 years, you will pay it off the five thousand dollars in thirty years. If you're like the rest of us, who will refinance or move or die or something else, then that would get paid back when that first mortgage but goes this away. This program, the twenty thousand, will never get paid back. This is forgivable. That is for it's written to be forgivable twenty percent a year for five years. So it will not revolve or be paid back. Okay. In that way, it's very different. Good. Okay. Um, so I talked about the benefits of why tying this with a mortgage is a good thing, but one could make an argument that it would be more efficient if you just paid down student loan debt by $20,000. Uh, when I'm thinking about my programs, the drawback of that is that would be counted as income, and now borrowers may not qualify for a VHFA mortgage because you may be over our income limits, which are quite low. So, um, so that is why doing this conduit approach makes sense when, if you really want this to be a housing related program. Um, one thing that, Senator, you said that. Um, so let me stop you there, because it's an important point. So um, if we just set up a fund to give people money to pay off their student debt, any money we give them would be considered income. Right. This would not be considered income the way this is structured? Correct. This is a loan. And a forgivable loan is not considered income. Really? Are you sure about that? For purposes of our um, programs. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. I don't know. You need Doug Farnham or someone to talk about how this gets recorded on the tax For forms. purposes of your programs, could you elaborate what you mean by that? Yeah, so we have, um, we sell tax exempt bonds and use that investor money to make loans. And so those um, private activity bonds are the programs called the Mortgage Revenue Bond Program, MRB, and there are a lot of federal rules that go with the MRB program. And in addition to all those federal rules, we then um, use a mortgage-backed security model and sell um, those loans to a secondary market, Fannie or Freddie. So not only do we have to make sure that the loans abide by the MRB rules because it's being funded with tax-exempt money, but also we need to make sure that those loans can be sellable on a secondary market and Fannie and Freddie imposes rules. So for instance, MRB rules may set my income limits here. Fannie and Freddie are telling me that they want income limits down here. So I have to go with the stricter of both sets of rules depending on what we're talking about. Assets, income, credit score, we could talk about a lot of things. So, um, yeah. Well, so I, I, that's, but what I'm trying to understand is, that being the case, if at some point you're effectively giving someone some money as you forgive those loans, there are loans that they borrow, you're forgiving the loan, regardless of the rules regarding income limits, I'm trying to understand why that would not be considered income received by the recipient when you do the forgiveness. Uh, most states, a lot of states, uh, down payment assistance programs, like the one we already have, mm -hmm. are actually forgivable loans. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of second liens that are forgivable, mm -hmm. it's a very common practice nationwide, happens all the time in the housing finance world. And again, uh, uh, someone from the tax department could speak to how in April that would get written up on their tax statements, but I can tell you that the federal government has decided that MRB rules that forgivable loans um, are not considered. Yeah, we're have to look at the, I had the same reaction, because yeah. in the business world, if you get a loan forgiven, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's taxable. Not in this. It, it may be taxable, yeah, be but they still are eligible to qualify.
qualify for. Oh, they just oh qualify. yeah, well, I mean, yeah. That's 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 your that's program. Yeah, it's whether or not it would be taxable so we'll for federal income and state and income tax purposes. Okay. <laughs> income to the individual at the point at which the loan is forgiven. And I'm smart enough to know that I would never give tax advice, which is why you need the tax department to come and say what the tax implications okay. are. Okay. I can tell you that for the housing okay. programs okay. that I run, okay. is not considered income, and they would not be ineligible for okay. our programs right. because right. of this structure. Okay. Great. Right. So we have got. I'm keeping a running list here. But I, I can tell you a concern I have about something I heard a moment ago, which is that um, I don't see how we could promise that the, let's say every year $4,000 is forgiven. I don't know how to make that money go to the student debt Direct. payment directly versus the boiler that breaks, right. the car muffler, the whatever else. Yep. So I can every year ask, what is your outstanding student indebtedness? And I can watch it go down by $4,000 a year. But if it doesn't one year or it doesn't for five years, I don't, I don't know right now how I could design a program that would require that unless well, let's not. Try, I mean, I think well, we do need to. I think we, we do can. need to design it that way. It has to be. But it designed. needs it needs some thought as to how, at least we can put an incentive there that the highest priority is to take that right. savings and put it towards student debt. So because I want to throw out a scenario that I could see happening with the way, and I don't know how to protect from this scenario. I'm going to throw out. I'm a borrower who qualifies for a hundred and seventy thousand dollar mortgage. I now hear about this $20,000 DPA program. I'm going to buy a home for $190,000. My mortgage payment is going to be the same as without your program. I don't have a savings to then take that 300 bucks and pay my student loan debt. How do you keep someone from not buying a bigger home than they would qualify for? Yeah. Qualifying for a home, I don't, if you've bought a home, I know I was qualified for a home price that I, I did not agree I could afford. Right. So I chose a home at a lower price. But if I found a home for 10 grand more, no lender was gonna stop me right. from doing that. Now my borrowers are in a different situation sometimes and they do come up against these limits, but I, so far do not see how we would protect from someone not buying a seven thousand dollar more expensive home or a ten thousand so twenty thousand would you if we tied it to technical assistance how much technical assistance do you provide currently for the down payment assistance program absolutely zero absolutely we require them to go to home buyer education for a few hours but i would not call it technical assistance okay at all because uh, you know i think you're right i think one would have to guard i mean a guard against exactly that. There are two things we have to focus on here is how do we protect them from buying a house they really can't afford, really shouldn't be affording. Um, well, they can't afford it thanks to your money. Yeah, right. And how do we also ensure that the debt forgiveness is applied to their student debt? Those are the two big things. And I thought actually the latter would not be quite so hard, but the, the former I hadn't thought about. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I can keep, I mean, I have, my home worship director has been thinking about this. We've looked at other states' models. I know um, at one point you asked about Maryland is well known that their housing finance agency has created a program um, around this. And we've looked at that. Um, Driving people to opportunity zones? No, no, no. It's, but I'm just saying they have a mortgage program that... Uh, specifically, people are qualified when they have certain debt. amounts of student, student loan debt, debt. Right. and um, you know they 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 have two versions of the same program. They have a program, then they added a 2.0 version. And the first one, it's interesting. You get um, I have to look my notes, but you get thirty or forty thousand um, dollars. You get fifteen percent of the home's purchase price as your DPA, your down payment assistance. And you have to pay off all of your student loan debt at the mortgage closing. So that's how you can make sure it happens. But I'll say I'm wrapping my mind around that and not understanding it. Because if I owe, let's say, $40,000 in student loan debt, you want to scale this program to be $20,000 assistance. I could use the state's money, essentially, for the $20,000 
but now I have to all of a sudden pay off twenty thousand dollars of student loan debt at closing. I mean, that's going to kill the program, right? Because my borrowers don't have that. Right, and the whole point of this is to do it thoughtfully and affordably and sustainably over four or five years. So, yeah. so more of seven minutes, can you wrap up, you think? I can. Okay. So, so because you're going to be kind enough to send us these notes and send this draft to, one of my questions is who's our primary drafter now that we have four parts? Is it going to be David that has the overall putting it together or is it going to be Abby? She does the tech stuff and I do the rest. Okay, so we'll merge them with you. You'll have the final sort of overall. Okay, great. So, so is this tax stuff? I didn't understand that answer. No, so Abby. Abby. Thank you. So if you'd be kind of to send your draft to both Abby and David, that'd be great. Just one question. Is it conceivable to structure some sort of a program in which the student loan debt becomes a second mortgage on the house with a mortgage guarantee, whether it be by the state or some or borrow of it, some form of that so it's, it's structured and attached to the home, presumably at a lower interest rate? That is possible. It's not a model that I recommend because um, I think I said less than 30% of student loan debt goes into forbearance or default at some point in the life. That is a really high percentage to a mortgage lender like me. I like to keep those numbers under 5%. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm very nervous about, as I have said, when you don't pay your student loan debt, you have a collections person calling you and that's really annoying. When you don't pay us, we foreclose, and that's on your credit record yeah, well, and all that. So I don't, I don't it. like merging right. student debt. It, the, 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 the problem you're trying to solve for, you're solving for X, and that is trying to have less of a monthly debt burden. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that that resolves the problem, because I don't hear that mm -hmm. um, interest rates are really the problem, especially in the last eight years. Um, low, even student loan debt has low interest rates. The problem is, is the outstanding deadness. It's that, mm -hmm. that monthly payment. Um, so uh, if some of these issues could be overcome, I will say um, I know you need fiscal notes, and I am not a fiscal note person, but I did look at um, VHFA's borrowers over the last several years in Opportunity Zones who were first-time home buyers, and I get down to 145 households, and they had these first-time home buyers in OZs. You know this population over you're looking what, at over what period of time? Over the last four years. Okay. And they had forty thousand five hundred dollars in average outstanding student loan debt, um, and they owed about three hundred and fifty bucks a month on it. And they still had they had ten years left on their loan. So the program is designed. You you really hit it. I mean, that's a great, you scaled it, I would say, unbeknownst to me, because I wasn't a part of this, really in the sweet spot. So that was serendipitous. That um, is David Hall. And he knows. so so on That's average, we, um, we originated about 36 loans a year in OZs. And if you wanted, I could tell it to you by OZ if you're that nerdy. Um, and so I would suggest that you would assume that maybe with some marketing, this could be scaled up to 50 loans a year. Um, and if each of those got 20 grand in down payment assistance and you want to market this and administer it, I'm thinking it's going to cost you a million dollars a year to support 50 home buyers each year. And that would be a reasonable scale if but you were to afford it. you only have 145 for a much smaller it was over four over, years. Over like four years. 36 a year. And then each plus $20,000. And that comes to 725000 And then you need to market it and administer it. And I haven't scaled That's not going to be $275,000. Well, I, I was just going by you saying you assumed you wanted to do 50 a year. And it, I, it's, it, if we're in the main program, if we're only doing 36 a year, I'm just questioning why we would start so aggressively at 50. Because Wait. in the bill that was handed to me, it talked a lot about marketing the program and right. ramping it up. And once we, um, we, we, haven't, we ended up with 36 OZ buyers without ever telling anyone what an OZ was. <laughs> Now, which is impressive. We would, well, I mean, that's that's our yeah. sweet spot. That's right. where we right. do mortgages in depressed areas of the state. And so, um, the not that all OZs are depressed, oh. and uh, but the 
if you want us to market it and if you put out twenty thousand right. dollars instead of five thousand dollars right. you will get more demand and if i we start training lenders and saying hey you have a market in um randolph so, no it's available think, I'm, it's going to go so, up just so we're clear i mean i think what you're saying is that's how much the program would cost if you serviced the demand but this is not an entitlement. We could set it at whatever level we want. We could do a, we could do a pilot for ten houses in the first year. Uh, while you can, I would also I, say I, that I, the I just, cost theoretically, of, honestly, mortgage lenders. Um, there are so many programs and so much to learn that if they think that something's only going to be around for a year, yep. uh, they, they will not even learn about right. it. One they, that's our other challenge: right. is how do we make sure this is around for a while? Yes, and so um, at some point, a, a pilot is exciting, and at some point, it's so boutique I can't sell it, and it's not worth us getting our computer systems and our servicers and all this up for ten loans a year. Got it. Yeah. So. Got it. No, yeah. You can't sell any, a boutique pilot. That's anything true. else before you head off to Albany? Uh, I didn't get to meet with the governor first, actually. All right, you got to go away. Well, right? begin yeah. with the best here. Yeah. Right. Certainly the most appreciative. Um, well, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> so we're going to switch over to 237. I want to say I find this idea very creative, and it's a good start. I mean, I think we're running into time pressures obviously but there are ways to even if you know I was thinking that this could potentially can go on its own could be part of the housing bill if you want to do it part of the housing bill you probably would vote the housing bill out without this and continue to work on it and see if we can add it on before it makes its way to the floor eventually so and there's also a possibility we could add it to it other be, vehicles too it could also be part of our work our, our economic development bill it could be. And that also I want to get out this week if possible. Okay. So, uh, so let's move on, okay? Yeah, yeah. this goes with uh, LA. Okay. Okay. This goes yeah, I've got We need both of them. Let's get yeah. organized yeah. here. Today is the 24th. Thank you, Chair. I've got notes on who to hear. I also want to hear more about the main plan, too. Uh, main plans hit some bugs. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, Ellen, do you want them? No, I don't. I have it. Okay. Thank you, Abby. Abby. Thank you, Abby. Where did Abby leave already? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Hello. Let me just get organized here. This is 331. Okay, 331, we're putting away, we're going to 237. Uh, you file file. Yes. Uh, you don't file with me? Yes. Uh, this is my file. Okay, we want that. I got that one. And Senator Carson, you have the housing file that you need? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, so 237, where we are is we're going to focus in the next, we have an hour, I guess, before we're buying a train on. Environmental portions of uh, 237, which includes municipal planning as well. So I think is it pretty much it was section one through eleven mm -hmm. in the original bill. Yeah. And if at all possible, I'd like to get a sort of a clear direction where we're going on those. So we're not going to vote on anything, but I want to get our our best thinking over to Senator Bray because he's very anxious to get something on as I wrote to you on on this on these sections and then tomorrow we'll talk about the other sections of the bill and we'll see where we go from, from there. So um, Ellen has been hard at work incorporating a lot of comments from people, changes that um, <coughs> changes that the administration has had hearing from VNRC and the towns and trying to put a proposal together that I think could work and that we should discuss. I think the biggest thing in here in terms of what she's going to go through, just to set a framework, is that what this version does is it combines what the bill has introduced, which you recall, had a lot of mandatory provisions on 
density and inclusionary zoning and uh, the administration had since, since they took that initial position, wanted it to a voluntary position. What this proposal does, I hope, uh, at least for discussion, is to make it voluntary for a three-year period, and then in, at the end of three years, will convert to a mandatory provision uh, with right. the hopes of uh, having the municipalities take the voluntary thing and the money we're offering them to change their bylaws for greater density to do it in a three-year period. And also, I would note that what the administration originally considered mandatory, it's not really mandatory at all, because it has an off-ramp to say there's too many uh, substantial municipal constraints that we're not in a position to change our bylaws. So is that clear, what I just said? Yes. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll say it. I, I know what well, I'll say it again because it's important. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the administration, yeah. the administration yeah. originally wanted it to be mandatory. mandatory. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then they came back and said, "Let's make it voluntary." So they took out all the provisions on density and inclusionary housing and all of that stuff. Uh, you know, small lots and, uh, and and whatnot, floodplains, all that stuff. Uh, and they made it voluntary. So what this version will do, and we'll go through it, would say, okay, it's voluntary, and we put money behind, like $350,000, to help the towns on a voluntary basis update their zoning regs to make for greater density. Then at the end of three years, the mandatory thing would kick in if they hadn't done it by then. However, the big footnote is that the administration's mandatory, in my mind, was never really mandatory to begin with, because you had an off-ramp from municipalities that didn't think they could change for various reasons. So they just have to file a piece of paper saying, we have municipal constraints and we're not doing that. And then they would report to, back to us that their mandatory thing really didn't work very well. So it's voluntary with money, mandatory with an off-ramp, and then we would look at it again for however many towns have not changed their bylaws. So right. it's pretty, well, it's pretty soft. Or towns that are like under 500 people where it's inappropriate. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there may be towns that are just too small for it to be. And then the other thing is, Chris Bray is gonna get his hands on all of this and probably have some suggestions in him. Anyhow, is that, did I explain it pretty much what's in here? Yes, and what we just, actually we discussed it last week, right. was the, the notion of either three or five years, right. uh, after three or five years. Okay, so let's walk I think through. we obviously have various degrees of enthusiasm about anything that becomes mandatory, whether now or three or five years from now. Yeah, and I, I would hope that for those people who don't have enthusiasm for that, that they would look at the off-ramp provision to keep towns protected. So we, we want to do, some, I think we want to do something. Maybe I, I read your email back to Chris. Maybe you don't want to do anything, but I want to do something to promote housing. And I think across this country, people are looking at density as a way to promote housing. This is sort of, I yeah, think, I, a fairly you, read, you read my email, I think, right. you, you see how. Yeah, we read your email. Yeah. Okay. Less than enthusiastic, people right. to say. Probably won't have you as the reporter, I guess. Looking forward to that. Well, I know that thing. Okay, let's let's move on. Interesting. See if we can get this over to Chris uh, today. Helen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. Um, I have draft 1.2 of the strike all amendment to S237, uh, and. It does sort of encompass what was originally sections one through 11, but it's a little bit longer now. Um, <laughs> um, and the, way, the, the way we did that, just to jump ahead, is so people know, is that there are some changes in here, substantive and technical, in sections one through 11, but the way we made it three years out is just by changing the effective date of these sections to be three years out, so. Yep. So starting on page one, um, this language is 
uh, the same from S237 as introduced. Uh, so we're in the uh, plan for the municipality, municipal zoning. So we're adding water supply lines and facilities and service areas, as well as waste disposal lines, facility and service areas to the map with the municipal plan. Anybody have any questions on that? Basically, information, more information to be part of the plan. And uh, two, page two, uh, still in section one, subdivision 10. This is also the same as uh, as introduced. Uh, well, what, when you do the, we can always, not too, uh, too much to hear again as to what it does. So I want you to just. Sure. So it does as, as opposed to just saying it's no change from the original. Okay. So I'm sorry, but I thought that in this version we were getting rid of. Ah, this was still considered okay by the administration in Section 10, lines four through nine, because it was complying with. You need to know where we still want to know where your sewer and water lines. Because I just want to point that out. It's the one shall that the administration supported. Yes. Yeah. Just right. Thank you. To have those those things mapped on the municipal maps. Yep. Yeah. Um, right. So then on page on page two, still in the the plan for the the municipal plan, it has to have a housing element um, with a recommended program for addressing low and moderate income housing, and the program shall comply with the requirements of section. 4412 to provide affordable housing. And that's the section we're about to get into. Okay, and, and the, I guess the one, um, in the terms of all the substantive changes we're doing on greater density, mm -hmm. one of the big areas was accessory dwelling units, yeah. and that was never part of the, the switch to voluntary that the administration Put in. They had all continued to say we want to do something from day one on ADU. So we're going to get into the ADU section, and you should just understand that this is not um, the zoning changes that are going to be voluntarily promoted during the first three years. This will go into effect immediately. The D section D. Starting on page, starting on page two, right? Bottom of page two. But I have a question in on line uh, fifteen. So I assume that the shall apply, which I would, uh, is only dealt with as an effective date three years out. Is that right? I mean, because this was, this is our moving to voluntary initially. So we haven't gotten there yet. But so this is shall existing. apply in every municipality is a big. Yep. So that's existing law. Oh, oh okay. And this so, is just right. Uh, of course. Forty-four twelve lays man. out right. um, the prohibited and required bylaws. So we're still in existing law. We haven't gotten to Got the it. voluntary okay. um, inclusion. Thank you, so, that's helpful. Yeah. So yeah. Every time we see a shell, we should jump up and down. Yep, and we haven't even gotten to the ADUs yet. He's a little ahead of me, so yes, I'm, I we're I almost mean, there. I apologize, yep, no. to the bottom of page three. Yeah. <laughs> yep, so, um, so the next change, so we're, the next change is on page three. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, starting on line one, within any regulatory district that allows multifamily residential dwellings, no bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting multi-unit residential dwellings of four or fewer as an allowed permitted use or of conditioning approval based on the character of, air, of the area. So we still aren't in, we're not into the voluntary stuff yet. This is still about um, required bylaws. So if you, this is saying if you have a multi unit district, you can't uh, prohibit, you can't say that there, uh, you have to allow four units. Or fewer. No, you can't prohibit fewer. You can prohibit five or more, but you have to allow up to four. Right. So how does, I'm not probably going to get into Chris Spray's area, but how does um, 
as an allowed, permitted, or conditioned. So they can still make it subject to conditional use, but they can't use character of the area as a criteria. Yes. That's the covenants that we were talking about. This is kind of blending the covenants, as far as I can understand. Um, it is a bit. A, a little bit, but I think that you heard testimony that sometimes uh, the argument is that a, a multifamily unit of, with four units doesn't meet the character of the neighborhood, like if there are other single family. Right. So um, that is to get at that, right. not necessarily the, the covenants. So right. How would something like parking work is in this situation? That uh, <laughs> We're going to get... Could you, the only, they can still do conditional uses based upon parking, they just can't do conditional use based upon character of the area. So if they have four units, they yes. might be able to say we need four times as many parking spots. Yes. Okay. And this section is one that the administration agrees with and they don't necessarily want to go to voluntary, they want to put this into a place now, right? I, I think so, uh, was my understanding. it's hard to remember exactly. Okay. Kate's looking surprised, so maybe it's not. Who? Inquisitive. Inquisitive. Where is she? Where is she? In the administration, so. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> no, the, the administration does not support this. Does not. Does not support Does not support So, when you said your voluntary stuff, you wanted this struck out as well? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we. We want to think about that, we'll think I mean, about but that we could just make this effective sure. three days, three years out as well. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they're probably not even going to support that. But that's okay. Um, I, I, we just didn't know when you went to when you went from mandated to voluntary. What was the scope of the stuff that was going? And I, I thought that ADUs <coughs> came in after your first draft. It was something that I was pushing. You came up with that, so I thought that was not necessarily part of the voluntary changes. Can you answer that question? Yeah, no, my understanding is that we, there, there were ADU provisions in the, in the administration package that, that uh, we've uh, since reversed. That you support. pulled back. Yeah, pulled back on okay. Which is too bad because it's an easy, reasonable way to increase Well, that doesn't that. mean we have to agree. Well, I, I, know. I, I think we heard enough about ADUs that we can go forward with that section. Yeah. So right this now. isn't the ADU section. Well, I know, but okay. we want to get to it. Okay. Yeah. It's an aspect. Right. Okay. Well, it's the counterpoint to ADUs. It's multi right. multi Yeah. But if you, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Our time is Well, time. well noted. Okay. okay. Uh, so subdivision E, starting on line five, is the ADU section. Okay. So. Except for flood hazard and fluvial erosion area bylaws adopted pursuant to section 4424 of this title, no bylaw shall have the effect of excluding as a permitted use one accessory dwelling unit that is located within or pertinent to a single family dwelling on an owner occupied lot. A bylaw may require a single family dwelling with an accessory dwelling unit to be subject to the same review, dimensional, and other controls as required for a single family dwelling without an accessory dwelling unit. An accessory dwelling unit means a distinct unit that is clearly subordinate to a single family dwelling and has facilities and provisions for independent living, including sleeping, food preparation, and sanitation, provided there is compliance with all of the following. The property has sufficient wastewater capacity the unit does not exceed 30% of the total habitable floor area of the single family dwelling or 900 square feet. So this uh, changes to this are based on uh, multiple pieces of testimony you heard um, and the, the chair and I um, re sort of combined multiple yeah. pieces of testimony. Oh, that's good. I think so essentially what we're changing here is that um, it still has to be owner-occupied, um, but you can, it was unclear before whether the owner had to live in a small unit or the big unit. Now it's clear that they can live in either one. Um, and it doesn't have to be limited to uh, an efficiency or one bedroom. You, can, you know, if 
you have the square footage you want to make it two bedrooms, you can do that. Right. And it's gives well, more flexibility. Now it gives it up to three nine hundred square feet. Um, and and again, the um, a town could do more if they want. They can be more liberal if they want, right? Yeah, this is just the bottom. Right. No, it actually does not exceed. It means it's the ceiling. There's no amount that is the smallest. Well, so this is, they can't prohibit. Right. Yeah. Okay. And what are, when you go, when you continue on, Helen, at points 20 and 21, mm -hmm. what are we doing here? How are we affecting existing law and as we continue with all of the stuff at F? This gets rid of the parking. I'm, I'm sorry, where? Beginning at the bottom on page three, mm -hmm. line oh. 20, Great. and continuing on page four to line 10. What are, what, are each, what are we doing with each change? Well, forget about the lines nine and ten for the moment. But what are we? How are we changing the law here in? So at the bottom of page three, that's removing one of the uh, criteria that uh, that the town can add. So uh, it's it's uh, not re the town can't require applicable setbacks coverage and parking requirements. Um, so it's removing that extra burden. Well, so I guess I have a question on that. Um, so if you're, if you're putting a, a, an accessory unit that's detached, is that saying that you, the town can't control that they put it right up to the lock line on the, to the next door neighbor? I don't, think, I don't think we want to do that. What was the question, Senator? I'm sorry. It's the setbacks. It seems like we're removing setback requirements for building accessory dwelling units. So <laughs> some of these units can, they don't have to be attached to the house. Right. They, they could be a separate tiny house or something right. like that. Um, I would think we'd want to allow the town to say you can't put it right up on the boundary line right. to the net, to the neighbor. Well, in tight spaces, I, there are lots of times when houses, when built structures are right up to the boundary line. It may be appropriate if it's at the back of the lot as opposed to the front. I can see what you. Well, this language, I don't know <coughs> who originally wrote it, but it was with the endorsement of the administration. So I'd ask the administration what they were intending this to do, if you don't mind. Yeah, and act actually the language that we sent over is quite, was quite different than, than this. But what, what I read is that the additional lines above um, account for this setback coverage and parking requirements because it says an owner a bottle may require a single family dwelling with near you to be subject to the same oh, okay. dimensional okay. and other controls. So those uh, those municipal regulatory gotcha. provisions will be preserved Thank in that you. one. Thank you. I figured it was easy easy in, easy out. Um, okay, so let me go on. So that this was redundant, that right, right. little section three. Right, thank you for that. Yeah, thank okay, you. so on line four, this gets rid of uh, additional use review. Same thing, right? Basically, we have the same answer we just got is covered by that other language on page 13. On line four. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> I think so. Line four. Well, this was never a problem before. I'm so this, this hasn't changed since the language, right? Okay. Um, let's talk about lines 9 and 10. Right, so this is, um, it's the same as the original, <clears throat> but it says that a bylaw can, <clears throat> sorry, nothing in this subdivision can prohibit a bylaw that regulates short-term rental, rental units distinctly from residential units. Did we talk about something with Senator Clarkson's I, I language? And does that appear later on? So, 
uh, based on our discussion yesterday, I thought you wanted it to go in the other amendment that you're going to do related to the other short-term rentals. Okay. Actually, so it wouldn't be inconsistent with this, but no, it's it's, in, it's not inconsistent with it. So the other the other what I thought we wanted to achieve a short-term right. rental sense. is yeah. your language right. plus gathering data on where all of these things were and having rulemaking to allow the gathering of data in a way that balances the need to get a handle on this issue with privacy of the owners and leave that for the agency to collect uh, data. It, and it's, you know, it's not a tax. I don't know if it's tax. Well, whichever. We have, we have tax. tax. It's this it's very short. Right. Tucker said, I think we have this. I do, plus, I do have it. Yeah. It's plus here I got for fails. Sorry. I only have four copies I can make. I can make some more. So we're not gonna do that today. Yeah, like, yeah. I thought that I was sort of hoping it would have been embedded, but there we are. Don't yeah, it will be in the bill. Yeah. Right. This is only half of the bill. The second half of the bill deals with mobile homes, accessory uh, not accessory yes. uh, mobile homes, uh, homelessness and short-term rentals and I think another part that David if he was here to tell us but I believe it's the draft okay so let's move on to bottom of page four all right so this is um, existing small lots so this is uh, starting on line 18 a municipality may not prohibit development of a lot not served or able to, be, to connect to municipal or water ser service if the lot is less than one eighth of an acre or the lot has a width, width or depth of less than 40 feet. So this is um, the same as in your bill, but it's uh, a uh, small does, lot. Does this fall into the three year thing or not? I guess, so as I drafted it, it wouldn't, but I suspect that okay. it would now, yes. Okay. I think we would probably want to change that one and the other one, but not the ADUs. I think the ADUs we should be doing now. I mean, that's an immediate opportunity. Okay, let's keep going. All right. Um, so on page five, this is the uh, inclusionary growth section, which we've sort of been referring to as the the mandatory versus voluntary um, set of bylaws uh, to encourage inclusionary growth. So this language hasn't changed, but in the effective dates, this uh, subdivision B is what I have um, going into effect in three years. Okay. <clears throat> so do you want me to read? I don't, actually, I prefer if you could sort of, because we're going to run out of time, if you can explain what's in these sections as opposed to right. reading the exact words. I mean, if there's drafting errors or something like that, we can change them after we get them over to Chris. But I just want to get the concepts of what we're asking the towns to voluntarily do with money behind it to help them do it. Yep. So uh, <clears throat> this relates a lot to density. So. Um, Bylaws can't prohibit lots of one quarter of 10,890 square feet or one quarter acre if it has uh, if it's able to connect to water system um, or 5,400 square feet or one eighth of an acre if it's able to connect to both water and sewer. Uh, There's also you crack my fuck Ellen. I don't know. Trying to remember everything that's in this section. Um, I know that the parking calculation is in this section, and I'm having a hard time remembering what B and C are for. Uh, but but is, B, is B, the way I read it, 
think you're missing something. Because every municipality shall um, the follow oh, land condition development. subdivision approval on obtaining a wastewater permit. Right, but is it? Um, or are we trying to lift the requirement that they get a state permit? And so I thought that's what we were trying to do. So now, now it's sort of you're saying they still have to condition it on getting a wastewater permit. I don't know. I, uh, I don't remember. Okay. Well, I don't remember. Put a question mark and we can find out, okay? We can find out what the purpose of that subsection is. Sure. How about C? Um, so this is saying a bylaw cannot prohibit uh, or condition or, or require conditional use for a two-unit dwelling uh, that's served uh, by water and sewer. To a greater extent than a one unit dwelling would be uh, regulated. Okay. And then. Uh, and a lot of this language was the original language that the administration put in. Right. Where they wanted it to be mandatory and now it to be right. voluntary. Right. And yeah. to the extent there were changes, this language came from Chris, right, to, right. to make any modifications. Okay. So the, and the shells are, are qualified in the effective date section by there being three years out. Right. And then I'm about, and then um, the municipal, uh, the municipalities can file a municipal constraint report. Um, saying that they're unable to comply with these. Right. But they want so there is a, that's what our chair refers to as the offer. Right. Yep. Depends on how fast you're going, how effective that offer is. Okay, D? Right, and then so D is about the parking. So um, this allows spaces to be, parking spaces to be counted as two if they will be rent, if they will be leased separately from the unit. Right. This provides for more flexible parking options. Okay, and then line 15, subsection 2 is the opt out? Right. Yep, so a municipality can file the cons substantial constraint report with the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, and if they do that, they don't have to adopt the bylaws in the above section. Um, and there's no, I remember we got some comment from somebody that this was not strong enough because it didn't require any action by the department so a town could file almost anything as long as they filed it there was no review of it in terms of saying this is good enough this is legitimate right. yeah so which which is not great i think i don't know if chris might want to change that but um the my understanding is there are some financial incentives uh, carrots rather than sticks to say you get priority if you do change your bylaws. So there's some incentive to not take this opt down. But I think we do need to address who reviews and says the constraints are actually vi are, 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 are viable. Well, that's very much a policy decision. Yeah, well, it, you know, I, I think there does need to be some lens through which the request to opt out is reviewed. Otherwise. Well, I think what I'd like to do at this late every, date is flag it for, for natural resources. Um, and we, we're not taking a vote on this for several days now. We can think about it some more, but we really haven't heard from the administration if we made that change, because their opt out did not have a review by anybody. They said they would just collect the data on how many towns opted out and say, well, we need to come back and change the law because this is not working. So I don't know that I want to make that heavy a change 
yeah. right now. It's I don't think this needs to be heavy. I just think it needs to be someone in the Department of Housing and Community Development says those are constraints that are that are challenging, and that we that we agree with the town that those are constraints that are hard to overcome. And right, and, and if they don't, and, and if we, and if they don't, not, then they, and if they don't. Then the I think in the discretion of the department they can work out uh, an extension of the of the time or tips <laughs> or you know we can, we, we can figure something out but I, I think that send it to environmental court to decide <laughs> no I didn't say well that. I mean no, but it's a good it's a good it's a question that it's legit. that that it's legit, it's legit in terms of it's not ready for prime time we don't have yeah. a, we don't have a penalty in there if they don't right. we don't have what the, the standards penalties. are. As to whether how they review it, you know, it's it's not. I don't think it's sufficient to just say ACCD will review it and make a decision whether they're right or wrong. Yeah. So uh, it does say on line on page seven, line five, that the department will provide a template and guidance on what should be in the report. Um, and then also later, there's a section where the department reports back on the types of municipal constraints that have been reported um, and whether there needs right. to be any recommendations right. to change that. So that is one of the guardrails on it. Okay. And these reports come back a little bit here. These reports come back. Um, no, the report, which is on page 10, is going to come back uh, in three years. Okay, what's the one on? So the um, template guidance come guidance that the municipalities know what to submit. Okay. Okay, I think we could go ahead to um, go past the municipal reports and go to incentives and funding. Sure, yeah. So on page eight, um, so, uh, on or before July 1, 2021, a municipality that requests technical assistance to update their bylaws to address inclusionary growth shall receive priority technical assistance through funding made available through the Regional Planning Commission. Um, and at the end of this bill, there is an appropriation section that has money um, for both the Regional Planning Commission and the Municipal Planning Commissions to assist in this process. And that is in the governor's proposed budget for this as, as an incentive for housing. Uh, so uh, that's covered. There was a, another 50, there's 150,000 for each of those entities and there's another 50,000, which I can't remember what it was for, but we wanted to add some help with um, Yes. So you'll have to so okay, we'll get to it. Do, okay. Um, right. So uh, then in subdivision B, the following state pro pro program shall prioritize funding to municipalities that have updated their bylaws. So state funding for municipal water and sewer systems, municipal planning grants under 4306, Vermont Community Development Program under Chapter 29 of Title 10. And the neighborhood development area historic tax credits. Okay. So those are the prior. Those are those um, municipalities that adopt the bylaws will receive priority under those programs. So those, that's the incentive. And, and, and <coughs> okay. And when we don't, at another point, I'd be, like to be reminded. How many towns that actually haven't done this yet did the 150,000 is supposed to help service? Because I'm just a little concerned that may not be enough. But anyway, there we are. Okay. Um, and then subdivision four on page nine. So this is about the restrictive covenants. So a municipality that adopts the bylaws for inclusionary growth. Um, can uh, essentially override restrictive covenants that um, conflict with the inclusionary growth bylaws. And that's um, the next section, section three. So you can just say that one more time. Like, so a couple it, of negatives in there. 
if you if a municipality adopts the inclusionary right. growth bylaws uh, okay so they can they can go ahead and pass bylaws that override restrictive covenants that conflict with those bylaws are overridden even existing no uh, moving forward from the effective date okay to avoid because the contracts clause issue okay yes yes um so if they adopt these enclosurinary growth bylaws the covenants uh, with some exceptions which we have additional language from jen on i hope yes. um, in in here of any the last sentence says the subsection will not affect enforceability of any existing deed restrictions great I, I, don't, I still don't quite understand the wording of this. Uh, when you may adopt bylaws that allow that something that's been restricted, which is past tense to me, is that in conflict with the last sentence? I, I, I tend to agree oh, that it could okay. be, could be uh, yeah. better written. I think we all know what we want to say yeah. here, but. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that this says yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Wh which, where, Randy? Uh, yeah, it basically, basically says that a, 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 a municipal may buy, buy bylaws right. uh, that, been, that yeah. affect development that has been restricted right. by competence conditions and so right. on. That's past tense. Right. So it's already been restricted, right. but then the last sentence says it shall not affect the enforceability of something. And to me, that right. is inherently in conflict. Right. right. Good catch. So let, uh, right. I, oh, I agree. Okay. Yeah. Bad feels better. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to line 11. So uh, this adds a new section, uh, covenants, conditions, and restrictions of substantial public interest. Deed restrictions, covenants, and similar binding agreements running with the land added after July 1, 2020, that prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting land development allowed under the municipal bylaws in a municipality that has adopted bylaws in accordance with 24 BSA 4412B3, which is the inclusionary growth uh, section, uh, shall not be valid. This section shall not affect the enforceability of any property interest held in whole or in part by a qualified organization or state agency as defined in 10 BSA 6301A including any restrictive easements, such as conservation easements and historic preservation rights and interests defined in 10 BSA 822. This section shall not affect the enforceability of any property interest that is restricted by a housing subsidy covenant as defined by section 610 of this title and held in whole or in part by an eligible applicant as defined in 10 BSA 3034 or the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And so the second half of that section essentially is the language that came from VHCB. Okay, I'm not sure that this can be cleaned up a little bit as well, and maybe even combined with the one we had problems right. with above. It seems in some ways the first sentence seems to be repetitive of subsection four above. Once we correct that, so basically what you're trying to say is that it's perspective only, but the bylaw can't, even in the future, can't restrict covenants that deal with affordability and um, substantial public interest and programs on that, correct? Okay. It's, it's <clears throat> to uh, avoid, it's to thwart people who may try to privately contract through restrictive covenants. Um, the municipal bylaws in cases of substantial public interest going forward which is the inclusionary growth okay but what we're trying to do here I, I, I think I understand is that you can't a town can't I mean a private contract can't override a bylaw of people who have adopted new bylaws um, 
except to the extent it already existed. That's part A. Right. And part B, uh, the town's bylaws can interfere with, um, or a contract can interfere with a, even if it's consistent with a bylaw to the extent it is a bylaw that governs perpetual affordability or um, a substantial public interest that exists in the public. Right, that's why I think Mora and, and BHCB wanted to have this additional language because they felt that their bylaws may, or their contracts prospectively may be inconsistent with the town's bylaw. So we can't work that. Right. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get it. If it may be right, and we'll clean it up, I just want to make sure we have the intent. Does this, the, I, I'm not seeing, and is this the only section we deal with the covenants that, that, um, that we know of in the bill? So does this adequately protect for green space that has covenants on them? The, my concern that I raised before, does, have you, is this your language? It is, yes. So uh, does this adequately protect for covenants of green space and, and, and things that have been made in dense downtowns that have that help make it attractive and worth living in? Any, pa any past covenants are protected. That's the blanket. Thing. Okay. Future covenants, I don't know if you want to answer that question. I'm not even, a general or with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, not able to answer it broadly of all town greens. This language is designed to the specific conservation easements that we and our partners in housing subsidy covenants, but I don't know what. I can't speak to all mechanisms we'll that may be protecting. Okay. I mean, that just is a big concern but yeah. because there are uh, right. places that are one right for possible development but that are actually key to keeping that town well, special and green downtown. I don't know if it's helpful or not helpful to add but I would say that the folks that I've talked to you know um, notwithstanding the intent of the department to be helpful here wouldn't this isn't a big problem that we encounter a lot oh, and if okay. it's a very problematic section there's okay the option of not including it okay Let's move on. I think we understand section four. So we're on to downtown exemptions. Yes. Act 250, downtown exemptions. Yes. Um, so section five, first, this adds a new definition of mixed income housing, which you received testimony on. Um, so it changes the definition of mixed income housing to mean a housing project in which the following apply owner-occupied housing at the time of initial sale. And what's the purpose for my change in the definition? Uh, this was the suggestion from uh, Vermont, ha Vermont Housing Finance. And, uh, oh, right. Okay. Sort of um, so because what's going to happen in this is that downtowns and, and uh, neighborhood development areas are exempt, which um, previously priority housing projects were defined um, right, right. In those areas. So, and also, um, Vermont Housing Finance, so, uh, they changed their how they calculate um, affordable housing to some extent. So, this the definition needs to uh, reflect the mechanism they're using so that it can then be used in the Act 250 process. So how does, my understanding of this section, the goal here is, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is that there used to be an incentive for priority housing to be built in downtowns. And they didn't have to go through Act 250. By virtue of taking the whole designated downtown and saying all develop, no development in that town has to go through Act 250, they lost some of their priority or there, and I guess I'm wondering what do they get back here by this change in terms of some sort of uh, some added incentive that they would get to develop in downtowns. Um, so uh, I think this is actually mostly to clarify that uh, the way that it's calculated now is it has changed um, because down on line down on line 18 where the the definition of priority housing project is amended so that it is um, within 
new town centers or growth centers. Right. So. But the, all development within. Mm -hmm. is, this, is this your, who brought us the concern about priority he housing? Did. Earhart did. It you, was Earhart. So this is the language that you agree with. Can you tell us what it's trying to do? So the uh, Earhart Mock of Vermont Affordable right. Housing Coalition. Right now, Ellen's focusing just on the VHFA technical correction. I believe she'll get to the other piece uh, in, a, in, in a separate section further down. Yeah. Right. Which so, is bottom of page 11, priority housing projects. Sorry. So um, they're, they're sort of intertwined, but uh, previously, mixed income housing had a definition using um, purchase price at the time of sale related to affordability, and the Vermont Housing Finance Agency no longer right. does right. that yeah. calculation, okay. and so it needed to be updated yeah. to reflect that. Right. I know. Uh, so, okay, I understand that. But yeah. This, is, this yep. is technical. I yep. remember more going through this. And that, so, right, so then the priority housing project changes down to online eight. <coughs> and so, um, it removes the reference to downtown and neighborhood uh, development area, right. or, and so a priority ha pro priority housing project is one that is in a new town center or growth center. Is this the section you would want to further on? Further on, yeah, when we get to the downtown, uh, the downtown, oh, yeah. the designated downtown <laughs> section and the neighborhood development area section. Okay, I'm gonna, I just wanna hear from Kate, yeah. if we can, because I know she has other impending issues, so uh, she's gonna be leaving her job temporarily, and uh, I wanna hear, VNRC had an amendment, and I wanna hear what, what any other concerns they have with this version of the bill at this point in the next, 10 minutes, I guess we're not going to get fully done. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm impending, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate the space to speak. Um, I've, I've just skimmed over uh, Kate McCarthy, Sustainable okay. Communities Program Director at the Vermont Natural Resources Council. And when I was last here, I spoke on many things I supported and a couple things I had concern about. Um, based on what I've heard you discuss this morning, I support the changes to the accessory dwelling unit language that you are working on, and I appreciate that you have retained the provisions uh, encouraging communities to create more density in smart growth areas, even though that is now a phase in. Very positive. The um, item I said I would work more on and try to understand better had to do with allowing river corridors in neighborhood development areas. So I was concerned the last right. time I was here. Then I had some conversations. I learned more. Um, so I'm here saying that I've changed my mind a little bit, and I'm going to tell you how um, how I feel, how the NRC believes that river corridors can be appropriately included in these areas where we want to have more housing in neighborhoods. So I sent around to the committee assistant this morning a handout that I see you have. And as I've sat here, I've cross-referenced that handout with the changes in draft 1.2 that you have been reviewing with Alan this morning. So what I would like to do is, is point out where the changes have been made and where they have not, and why we think that's in, why it's important. So I will start by going uh, <coughs> discussing item one on my list of proposed changes, which was a desire to clarify the meaning of undeveloped. In draft 1.2 of the bill, that can be found on page 19. Page 19. Page 19 of draft 1.2. Line, starting on line 13. So um, this, is, this is the part of the proposal that makes the big change that goes from totally excluding identified flood hazard and fluvial erosion areas, areas to excluding only those that are undeveloped. So it's only a subset of the river corridor that will be excluded. So then I thought, well, what, it, what constitutes undeveloped? What do we mean by that? If it's a parking lot, is it undeveloped? Or does it have to be a garden or completely raw land never touched by human hands? So in- None of that. Uh, like not much of that. Anymore. Not much of that. Um, so I propose to clarify the meaning of undeveloped uh, in item one of my, of my proposal that was not incorporated into this draft. What I would like to see is that, um, it include only areas containing pre-existing development, 
and areas suitable for infill development as defined in the flood hazard area and river corridor rule. So the flood hazard area and river corridor rule has a definition of what developed is and a definition of what infill is. The reason that this is important is that you might want to infill on land that's close to your compact area but not previously developed. So there's that narrow range of circumstances where relatively raw land is going to be suitable for infill because it makes a place more compact. This proposal attempts to get at that. So does your proposal um, promote housing development or restrict housing development more? Creates a new opportunity. <laughs> it, I, I think it promotes it by allowing <laughs> river corridor areas to be included in neighborhood development areas under specific conditions. It's basically what was proposed before by the administration, but it clarifies what constitutes undeveloped land. Okay, thank you. Just a technical question, this maybe for Ellen. Is it appropriate to include uh, a rule within a statute? I would like to know the answer to that as well. Uh, I, I think it is, from my experience, yeah. yeah. yeah can, I mean, yeah, the rules are, rules are subject to change they almost are at a whim. To change. So are statutes. Yeah. I've, I've, Whereas I've, seen, we're, I've seen it done before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had just a question that immediately came to mind. Sure. You do run the risk that the rule will be changed, and so you, I could take the language from the rule as it exists now and, and add it. Mm -hmm. It's certainly more precise. Right. Yep. You would save your time looking it up. Yes, all the cross referencing. Okay. Thank you. Can you uh, double check with other people in your office, Senator Brock's question? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, 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 I've seen it before as cross reference to rules. And we certainly delegate rulemaking authority, you know, and say that the. So just, but just if, you, if you don't mind doing that, that'd be great. Um, but I, I agree with you. Okay, so um, um, so that, yep. So item two on the um, handout that, that I've given you is to provide additional specificity and ensure that, to, to elaborate upon what it means for local bylaw provisions to be adequate to protect um, any any development from harm. <coughs> so the proposal. Uh, one of the reasons that the administration um, believed that this was appropriate to include is that they're saying you can include these river corridor areas in a neighborhood development area so long as certain types of bylaws are in place. The things that I am proposing that are in red um, are is language to say more specifically what those bylaws should really include. So it, again, cross-references um, another publication, the Flood Hazard Area Rules, which says how you can safely develop within a settled area in a river corridor. So it cross-references something specific to be looked at instead of just saying deemed consistent with ANR policy, basically. Um, so I think that's important. Um, that was included, that cross-reference is included in the proposed bill, draft 1.2, page 20 line nine. There are two things additionally that I would suggest that have not been incorporated into the bill. The first is the last sentence in red. If a neighborhood development area includes flood hazard areas or river corridors, local bylaw must also contain provisions to protect river corridors outside the neighborhood development area, consistent with ANR model river corridor bylaws. What that, do is it, what that does is it says, don't just develop bylaws that help protect your settled area. Develop river corridor bylaws that address unsettled areas. And that helps keep the river healthy and reduces the risk of flooding downstream. So we think do it, do it comprehensively, do it right. The other suggestion I would make, um, you will see in draft 1.2 that it references in line 10, development within an existing settlement I would, page. Oh, sorry, page 20 of draft 1.2, okay, yeah. line 10. Um, I would advise against using the term existing settlement. That is a term that is defined in Title 10 in Act 250. Um, I believe we're in Title 24 here, so it doesn't technically have the same definition. But we are talking about neighborhood <coughs> development areas, so I would suggest simply saying neighborhood development areas so as to avoid confusion. Within an NDA. 
within yes. the ADA and BA. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry for such the technical line iteming that we're doing here, but I, I just want to highlight for you what's in here that is not in our proposal that you may wish to consider. Okay. So that is all I have to say about our second suggestion. So then on page two of my handout, <coughs> item, the third and last item for you to consider, um, this, this affects a part of draft 1.2 that's at the top of page 20 of draft 1.2. Draft 1.2 says that when you're making a neighborhood development area, you avoid or minimize to the extent feasible the exclusion of important natural resources as defined in da 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 da. Um, what I would suggest, since you're talking in this section about avoiding or minimizing the inclusion of certain natural resources, add reference to the things that we've been talking about here, right. flood hazard areas and river corridors. Those two items are not currently included in the definition of important natural resources. And they are. Is that it? Um, the other thing that, that I need to say that you will not be surprised to hear is to reiterate the NRC's position that if, uh, if the exemption uh, for development in downtowns and neighborhood development areas carries forth without the commensurate protections for outlying areas, that will hinder our support of this bill. We'd really like to see that as part of the bigger package and conversation because it is about a balance of promoting the downtowns while protecting the uh, uh, underlying outlying areas. And does that translate into reducing the district commission power to? No. Oh, no. No, no I thought that, that has to do with what, process what, that okay. has been discussed what, what a lot. I'm talking the, about jurisdiction. What is the piece that you say is you need to see to have your support? It's in, a, sure. it's in the Act 250 bill. It's in it's the Act 250 bill. bill, and it has to do with using drive the cumulative driveways and um, roads as a trigger for is that, is that, is force that, fragmentation protection. Is that in danger of coming out at this point, as far as you know? Is it in danger of coming out of the Act 250 bill? Yeah. As far as I know is the operative word, phrase. It is not, it is It is in there now, but because it's not in S-237, because the exemption for downtowns okay. and neighborhood development areas are standalone, that is a, a problem. For so us. in what section is <laughs> the current Act 250 bill? Off the top of my head, I don't know the section. So, but, are, but you want us to put that in this to serve as the tit for tat protection? I don't want to undermine the. I, I think that it could come out of this bill and be taken care of in the other bill. Is the more the direction that, right. that I am thinking of? So we have it in here, and so natural resources could do that work as but part of their work. They could. So it's perhaps. not in our bill right now, right? It is not. Right. The outlying area protections are not in your okay. bill. I think that's her concern. Right. Okay. And so I would encourage you, given that we have to sadly go to this training. No, no, no. Not sadly. Thank We're you. delighted to go to this training. <laughs> and I'm delighted that you're I just am training. sad it has been rescheduled. How about that? Is that okay? I'm thrilled with the training. Sad I've got to rescheduled. She's going to miss Okay. No. So, but no, I just want to wrap it up. We do have to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we Thank got you. the yep. message. Uh, we'll take this up again. Tomorrow I'll talk to Chris. He won't be happy, but uh, we'll get through this tomorrow. Um, and uh, I think in this area, I don't know if other people feel the way. I know we're trying to promote housing, but this is the floodways and floodplains are as about as connected to natural resources as any part of this bill. So I think we're going to hand over our version and this memo and let them decide how they want to go on floodplains. And, and every one of our proposed uh, increased density areas has rivers flowing through them, most of them. Yeah. Well, but it's not safe. Yeah, no, 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 I'm just saying this is important for us to deal with. 